and if I had proper sound effects, it would be very loud. But uh, uh, now um, I want to tell you uh, how did we get here. Um, so, but first, astronomers will say uh, the whole universe that we can see today, 13.7 billion light years in every direction, it at one time could fit inside the volume of a golf ball. So how could that possibly be? Uh, well, um, let me uh, explain something. Um, <clears throat> atoms are almost empty. The universe is almost empty. If, if you try to take a trip to the nearest star, it's zillions of light years. Uh, it's 40 light years away. and It'll take us forever to get there. The universe is almost empty. Even atoms are almost empty. If you were to take the atom and s expand it to the size of the whole Earth, then the atomic nucleus in the middle, the th where almost all the mass is located, would be only as big as two Goodyear blimps. So atoms are empty. Uh, so even if you squeeze tight on an atomic nucleus, atomic nuclei are almost empty too. So you, um, they're tiny point-like particles inside, and they swirl around. So just imagine that the entire universe was run backwards until the uh, stars would touch, the atoms would touch, the atomic nuclei would touch. Everything gets hotter, everything goes faster. But it's really, according to astronomers, we could really put the entire thing into a tiny volume of a golf ball. So, um, well, that's pretty hard to think about. But uh, now the hard question is maybe, how come we're here? If it's all flying apart, why isn't it still flying apart? And so here's our story. Um, there are some parts of the universe that were a little more dense than others. And the self-gravitation of the material in those small volumes was able to say, well, OK, I've just got enough gravity to stop the expansion near me. And so some small pieces would stop expanding. So uh, the denser one would stop expanding sooner and co collapse to form maybe the first star. And then uh, a slightly less dense region would take a little longer to collapse, and eventually it'd form a star also. So after stars form, of course, then we can have nuclear reactions. Um, <coughs> and uh, stars like the sun can burn and uh, produce chemical elements and we can be here. So it's because some small regions of this Big Bang must have been a little more dense than others that we can, be, that we can exist. So how, how would we know how much stuff is in the universe? Well, for many generations of astronomers have been saying, well, let's uh, see how the universe uh, ex stops expanding. It must be slowing down because of all the gravitational forces of the galaxies pulling back on each other. So I've got a drawing here that illustrates that. Here are all these attractive forces between the galaxies. So uh, for about uh, 60 or so years, astronomers uh, believed that this was the right picture. And they said, OK, we'll just find out how fast is the, excel is the uh, expansion slowing down. We'll calculate how much matter that takes, and then we'll know the density of the universe. Uh, well, there was a surprise coming, which I'll come to later. Uh, but uh, <coughs> Now, let me show you how we think uh, galaxies might have formed. Now, we can, we can do the same, same kind of calculations that the weathermen do with uh, the air on the Earth. We say, we think we know where all the stuff is yesterday. Uh, we think we know how fast it's moving. We think we know how it does stuff. So let's put it all into a computer simulation. So here is a box of primordial material. Uh, imagine that you could take a perspective so it wasn't expanding. So what we see here is the primordial material flowing together under its own gravitation uh, to make galaxies. Uh, and that's what these little speckles are on the picture. So maybe it was like that. Maybe it wasn't. Uh, but it would be a good thing to check this out. So uh, many generations of astronomers have been trying to see if this is the right picture. Uh, so that's the sort of basic scientific background. Now I want to tell you about some of my life in this subject. Uh, in 1974, I finished graduate school, having tried to make a measurement of this cosmic microwave background radiation. And uh, this is five years after the Apollo launch uh, that went to the moon. So as, uh, NASA was now soliciting proposals for scientific satellites. So I told my, uh, my advisor, well, you know, my thesis project was really hard. Uh, and I'm really tired of working on that subject. But it would have been better if we could have done it in space instead of hanging our apparatus on a balloon. And so uh, he said, well, call up your friends. Uh, here's a list of people to call. Make a team. Propose the satellite. It was called the Cosmic Background Explorer Satellite in uh, 1974. Well, we didn't really expect that it would be chosen, but uh, out of the 150 proposals that were su submitted, about uh, 10 or 12 were actually chosen, and ours was one of them. So 
This thing which we sketched in the days before computers could draw, um, that is about what it looked like in 1974. Um, after a long process, uh, we built something that looked a lot like that, and this is what it looked like in 1989, the artist's uh, view of it. Uh, so uh, this satellite is still up there. It's called the Cosmic Background Explorer. It's about uh, 560 miles above the Earth and orbits around uh, every 103 minutes. And uh, it's in an orbit so that the sun always shines on the side and the Earth is always underneath. So this instrument package up here is always protected. So that's real important because the thing we're trying to find is really faint and the Earth is really bright. So we've got to protect the instrument package. So there's a tank of liquid helium up there in the top to protect two of the instruments. And there's this conical shield around them which protects everything very well. So in uh, 1982, we got approved to build this uh, at Goddard Space Flight Center uh, using in-house engineering teams. Uh, and we were building right along and in 1986, the Space Shuttle Challenger blew up on launch. Uh, we were going to use one of the space shuttles to carry this satellite into orbit, uh, and uh, we had a different design. So uh, we had to change the design and rebuild the entire apparatus uh, to go up on an old-fashioned expendable Delta rocket. So this is the way that it finally looked. Um, but we took us only a little over three years to finish that complete redesign, and it was launched in 1989. And so within a few weeks of it, uh, we had a, a major scientific result, which I'm, I'm about to show you. Um, and here is the, uh, this is my thesis project uh, made bigger and better. Um, and so uh, what it, it's called is the Far Infrared Absolute Spectrophotometer. And the purpose of it is to find out if the Big Bang radiation uh, that's coming to us has the right spectrum. And the spectrum is how bright is the radiation at each different wavelength. So uh, there's a particular theoretical curve uh, that it should follow. And so the main point here was that we could take our little thing, we call it a movable black calibrator, but this is supposed to emit exactly the same kind of radiation that the Big Bang would have given us. So if we uh, measure the sky, and then we put this apparatus, this calibrator body in there, in place of the sky, and we get the same answer, then we've confirmed that the Big Bang theory is correct. So that's what we did. Uh, I made it sound simple, but it isn't. Uh, this is a design of an apparatus which is, we trace back to Albert Michelson. Uh, who was the first American scientist to win a Nobel Prize. Uh, and he basically invented this whole technique of dividing light and having it interfere uh, with itself and come back to be analyzed. So uh, without going into the details of how it's done, let me just show you the answer that we got. Uh, and here is the theoretical curve. Uh, the smooth curve is a theory, and the measurements are the little boxes that are right on the curve. So this is uh, based on only nine minutes of data that we had taken uh, early in the first few weeks of operation. And we already could tell that our basic objective had been met. Uh, the Big Bang Theory is correct because the little boxes are all on the curve. Uh, and so this uh, particular curve got us a standing ovation. And uh, it was quite a surprise to me. I, didn't, I thought, well, okay, everybody knows that's the right answer. But everybody did not know that it was the right answer. We had uh, many measurements that had been taken, uh, including with my thesis apparatus, uh, that had given uh, misleading or wrong answers. And we had many bizarre kinds of theories uh, that would say, well, the Big Bang isn't correct. Something else is, is going on. And so um, not only is it a nice curve that looks pretty to look at uh, and, and uh, fits uh, people's wishes about what the Big Bang should be like, uh, it actually is a tremendous relief because before this we had some really bad theories. And um, there was even a uh, competing very ingenious theory called the steady state theory that said it's only, a, the universe is fooling us. It only looks like it came from an explosion. It's been here for zillions of years and it keeps replenishing itself. Uh, and matter is being created to replace the, um, what seems to be stretched out. So um, that whole theory could never explain this curve. So that was a, a big point and a tremendous uh, end of, of discussion. Um, <clears throat> so now this curve is in textbooks every place. So we even now have the exact measurement of the temperature. This is uh, 2.725 degrees above absolute zero. <clears throat> and I should tell you that the radiation is pretty bright. Uh, if you were to tune your TV to a uh, channel in between channels uh, where there's no signal and uh, you see this snowy pattern on the screen, <clears throat> about 1% of those little snowflakes on the screen come from this radiation. So it's, uh, 
it's pretty bright. There's a lot of it. It's just hard to measure.